welcome everybody. My name is Barbara Stutes. I am the Open Educational Resources and Instructional Materials Program Manager here at OSPI. And we are very happy that you could uh, join us today for our 2021-2022 uh, OER Grantee Resource Showcase. I'm really excited to share uh, these resources with you. And uh, I think you'll be very pleased at all of the, the great stuff that there is to, to offer. I would like to start with a, a land acknowledgement and let you know that today I am joining from Olympia on the traditional homelands of the Squaxin Island tribe. Uh, these are the maritime people who lived and prospered along the shores of the southernmost inlet of the Salish Sea. The Squaxin Island tribe has stewarded this land since time immemorial and still inhabits the area today, and we are very thankful for their stewardship. So the resources that you're going to be seeing today were developed by the recipients of the 2122 OSPI OER project grant. And this opportunity targets the development or adaptation of openly licensed resources, especially in content areas that are currently lacking um, in uh, really high quality standards aligned uh, resources. Just to give us a little bit of context and put us all on the same page here, um, if you're not familiar with open educational resources, these are any instructional materials, any resources really where the copyright holder has given permission folks to um, use to adapt and to redistribute those materials. So when you think of open, um, it's not just any free resource on the web. These are actually free resources that have certain permissions baked in. And for our K-12 audience, there are a number of these five that uh, really rise to the top in terms of, of importance. Number one really being that ability to adapt and to revise. Um, to take the content that's presented and contextualize it and make it appropriate for the target group of students that you're working with. Another really important one, especially for K-12, is this ability to retain, to actually download the content and put it on your own district learning management system or make it available offline for your students. Um, just the ability to not be dependent on internet access to necessarily um, use and, and distribute those materials. All of the resources that we're going to be taking a look at today are, uh, are located on our Washington OER Hub. Our Washington OER Hub is the online platform that we have for sharing resources that were created by or curated for Washington educators. And this is the best way that we have of really promoting equitable access to strong standards aligned quality instructional materials. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for our grantees to share all the wonderful work that they've been developing uh, with a much larger audience across the state, around the nation, around the world. You will have links to both the Washington OER Hub and the specific group where all of these resources that can be found are our Washington OER grantee um, work group. And I will ask Tracy, if you don't mind, if in the chat window, if you could please post links to both the Washington OER Hub and to our grantee group. Um, that way folks will be able to um, have access to the materials. All right, with that, I am gonna shut up and turn you over to the stars of the show who are our Washington OER grantees for this past year. Uh, they have been doing some phenomenal work and um, I think you'll be really excited to see all of the options that are available to you. So I am going to turn it over to Kathy Carano from the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Youth who is gonna start off our program. And Kathy, I believe I'm running your slides for you. So just let me know when you are ready for me to move forward. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you can go forward from this. This one's just, hello, that's me. Um, so, so basically what uh, we did is a group of teachers, I got I gathered up a group of teachers and we decided, one of our problems was when a deaf hard of hearing student who's gone through the public schools gets into high school, how did they um, navigate the rest of their lives? Um, 
how to navigate being a deaf adult, how do they navigate being a hard of hearing adult. So what we did is I gathered up a bunch of wonderful teachers and uh, we brainstormed some ideas of things that we thought were important. We had some deaf people on our team and some hearing teachers and we created some guiding questions along with resources. So if you go to the next slide. So these are the four big things. Who am I? Some self-identification, some, am I deaf? Am I hard of hearing? Who do I identify with? What do I want? Um, so basically what I'm giving you is a deaf path curriculum. That's what we you'll get when you go to the OER website. Um, so each topic has lists of some questions, um, resources, standards. Um, how do I get there? If I want to do something, how do I get there? Like it could be a list of resources in your community. And then how do I stay there in terms of jobs? How do I get a good job? When I get a good job, what is that supposed to look like? And how do I get to stay at this job that I want or move on to the next job? Next slide, please. So basically what we have is a mixture of videos, worksheets, the standards to really help a student navigate life in high school and then after high school. And some of the areas were like, why do I have an IP? Um, what are my strengths? What are my local resources? What are my communication needs? Am I a person who needs an interpreter? Am I a person who can get by by using my phone? Um, who is my community? Am I gonna be a, in the deaf community? Am I gonna be more with hard of hearing kids or people? Or am I going to be in the hearing community? Career interests. Um, so even questions about um, SSI, what's going to happen when I leave high school? What if I get a job? How, how much can I work? So these are it's basically about seven pages. And all I have to do is click on the links and the, the video will pop up or the sheet will pop up that helps you. Um, because and they're all reproducible. They're all free as OER requires and so we really went through and we found some stuff but it was on teacher pay teacher we threw that out so these are basically the resources we have there um if you ever and it doesn't you, your students don't have to be deaf it could be anything about how to guide them through high school but um it was a great opportunity and i have to say if you've never written a grant uh, Barbara Soots is your woman because she holds your hand when you don't know what you're doing um, and it, it worked out beautifully so I appreciate um, OSPI and Barbara for all her help with this and I'm done. Thanks Kathy. Um, I am going to forward us along to the next presenter. Uh, so Pranjali I'm going to stop Stop sharing my screen and I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you. Um, it's truly a joy to be here and I'm really excited to share some of the work that we've been doing for the past several years that has continued this year as well. Um, so my name is Pranjali Upadhyay and I work at ESD 112 and uh, it's located in Southwest Washington. And our project for the past several years has focused around developing uh, STEM storylines or STEAM storylines that are intended to support high quality STEM instruction in K through five. And it's been a, a wonderful collaborative process with working with Barbara and then also working um, with our Climb Time grant. Some of the funding has come from that as well. Um, and so the purpose of this project was to create a resource that would support teachers in Southwest Washington and um, with a curricular resource that would um, use a local or global problem, uh, present that to students and then engage them in deeper learning around STEM uh, while integrating English language arts, art and social studies. So our integration process has really, um, I think it's uh, improved over time. So now we're also looking at integrating um, so we've gotten a little bit more serious about integration of social studies and um, looking at culturally responsive practices and ethnic studies and um, indigenous ways of knowing, pulling that into the science curriculum and the STEM curriculum. Um, we're also pulling in more art and more ELA. So it's been an exciting uh, kind of process. And um, so we're also really focusing on 
uh, providing a resource that helps teachers in supporting their students and building a really positive STEM identity so that they hopefully pursue um, more STEM in the future and also see themselves as capable of uh, doing of doing science in in their world. So our storylines are located on the Washington OER hub um, and also on stemmaterials.org. And um, this storyline was our most recently published one. It's called Becoming Protectors of the Earth. And um, it's probably one of my favorite ones. So that's where that um, our resources are located. And just to give you a little idea of what the, the storylines look like, they include a pretty in-depth teacher guide um, Google Slides that accompany the teacher uh, facing materials. Uh, in those slides, we have a lot of videos, we have a lot of um, handouts, which I call thinking templates. And then we also have for many of our storylines, a webinar that kind of walks teachers through um, the entire curriculum unit. So uh, that is some of what um, we have available there. And then I wanted to actually take a second and show you, um, just a, a quick, um, just for a second, what our units look like. So here is one, uh, the one I was showing you. We have um, an outline in the beginning with a table of contents that's pretty detailed. And then we have um, each session is kind of like one class uh, session of approximately 45 minutes. So we've uh, gotten a lot of feedback from teachers about um, usability and there's been a lot of changes over the past few years in the formatting of these units so uh, teachers have been really a, a big part of the the process of actually developing the units and also um, kind of like design changes that we've been making over the past few years so I just wanted to show you that and then also um, wanted to show you we have a stem and uh, we have a scope and sequence whoops Okay, webinar. that's my webinar, but we're not going to watch that right now. So here's um, a STEM uh, scope and sequence that is pretty much um, all the storylines and how they align with um, physical science, earth science, and life science strands from K through five. So I've actually linked it in here. Um, so you have that link to that document that shows um, how our storylines map onto um, K through five and address the various NGS standards um, from K through five. So you can check that out um, when you have a chance. And there's uh, two storylines that will be published um, very soon. We've, we're in the process of finalizing um, those and that will kind of complete our scope and sequence for the uh, K through five uh, STEM curriculum. And here's just some work samples that I thought would be fun to share. So um, this was created by fifth graders. It's a one slide out of um, their uh, project that they created uh, advocating for the preservation of Western pond turtles, which are uh, native to our area that are very endangered. So um, all the units, uh, they try to center student voice and student choice and student inquiry is what drives kind of the direction of the learning. And that's how uh, students are kind of digging deeper into, into STEM concepts and um, having a voice in their community. So this is um, from a STEM fair that was put on um, in Longview School District um, and students were able to share their work with their community. And that is pretty much what I had planned because I didn't want to talk too much. So uh, thank you so much, Barbara, for the opportunity to share. Um, and uh, please reach out if uh, you'd like to connect. Thank you again, Barbara. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so good to be here. Um, my name is Chris Carter, the Humanities Manager with Educurious. Um, joined with my colleague here, Blake, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Blake. I work in partner relations and program management at Educurious. Um, Educurious, just real quick, is a small education nonprofit uh, in Seattle. Um, what we're known for is project-based learning, and we focus in on social studies and science because we believe that's where the world is changing the most, and that's where students can have the most impact. So the project that we're focusing on or that we've been focused on for the last two plus years has been the Washington State History Project. Um, and this is from middle school, um, where we brought together educators, district facilitators, cultural consultants, 
uh, local experts um, who co-designed six Washington State history project-based learning or PBL curriculum units that represent critical issues. Um, they're anti-bias, interdisciplinary. Um, th they are personalized, but we're working to further that work um, this next school year as well. Um, and they're aligned to the Washington State Standards for Social Studies and the C3 Framework. And on the right side of the screen here, you can see the titles for the six units. Um, we have Connected, um, Decisions That Define Us, Roaring Rivers, um, a hashtag units on social media and government, uh, innovation through the lens, um, and then resettling in Washington. Next slide. Um, there were six districts that we have partnered with on this project um, that came together to initiate the co-design collaboration um, because of the need for high quality equity focused uh, curriculum that highlights undertold stories um, in Washington. Um, the Washington State History Project weaves together original content um, since time and memorial curricular connections, um, multimedia resources uh, to ensure high levels of learning um, and engagement from across uh, students in Washington State. And a shout out to our partner school districts here on the right um, who have been with us uh, on this journey uh, from the beginning and just really appreciative um, of their support. Next slide. Um, so what, what you'll find in the curriculum. So it's an OER curriculum. It's available on OER Commons. Um, there are six units in total. There are five represented here on the left. We're actually wrapping up the sixth one uh, this week and next week. Um, the units vary in length from two to four weeks, project-based and inquiry-driven. They're conceptually designed, standards aligned. Uh, rich in media and text, you'll find a lot of text and video, um, primary sources, firsthand accounts that have been linked and built in. Um, and all of the materials are fully adaptable. And we'll take a look at what we'll find in um, each of these units here in just a moment. The units are module in nature. So this is the sequence in which we design them but it doesn't mean it's the sequence in which um, teachers or schools or districts might use them. Um, so this gives you kind of an overview of the titles at the top, the unit lengths, um, the standards, there are different clusters of standards depending on uh, the focus of that unit. As you can see here, some are more history-based or history-focused units while others are more geography-focused. Um, all of the uh, units have a driving question or an anchor question. Um, that supports and um, furthers inquiry. And then all of the units, because they're project-based learning units, um, have final products where students bring together uh, what they've learned across the unit um, and present that in some uh, creative format um, at the end of the, uh, the unit. So you can see a few examples of that here. Um, so in uh, rights, hashtag rights, representation change, students create a social media campaign uh, that engages elected officials. Um, they create a photo essay in innovation through the lens um, and in resettling in Washington, they create a podcast. So every unit has a, a different product. Next slide. Great. So as Chris pointed out, uh, there are six units that uh, constitute this full year OER resource for Washington State history. We currently have uh, units posted in OER, which are the three that are listed on the top there, Decisions That Define Us, Roy Rivers, and Rights Representation Change. Within the OER Commons, you're able to download a full teacher's guide, as, as well as within the teacher's guide, you can get the adaptable documents. So that means that you not only have the work that we've created, if you want to, if teachers want to modify it for their specific class, the uh, names specific Washington State's history of their of their region. We all know various portions of the state have their own uh, rich history, so it's adaptable for teachers. And then the units that are coming soon, all six will be up eventually, uh, but as we are finishing up, the next three will be coming up in the coming weeks and months. Next slide, Barbara. Oh, there you go. Uh, we do have some other units that we wanted to give a shout out to. Uh, we uh, posted them on OER Commons that are both middle school and high school based. These uh, are three units 
uh, that are our American History Ethnic Studies uh, course, not course rather, but just uh, modular units. Uh, Palante Almer with Arts, which is about art from the Puerto Rican uh, community and the uh, struggle for recognition and uh, street, uh, basically discussing the relationship of politics that went into that uh, from, from that viewpoint. Reporting on Reconstruction's Legacy and the Voices of the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Uh, these are all have the same uh, credentials where we put in a lot of time and effort to get first uh, primary as well as secondary sources. And you can get the teacher's guide as well as adaptable Word documents to be able to modify it to your classroom for teachers, that is. Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Blake. Uh, just a quick look under the hood. Um, each unit has a teacher binder um, or a teacher edition that Blake noted. There's a table of context that indexes all the resources in there. There are module overviews that you see here next to the table of contents, which give you a quick summary of the lessons and the learning in the unit. Um, every lesson has a detailed lesson plan with hyperlinked resources. And those adaptable materials Blake mentioned are on the right here in the form of slide decks and Word documents or student handouts. Next slide. So implementation tips, um, you know, here's Blake's email address. If you are interested in learning more about um, these units or the course as a scope and sequence, um, or you're interested in student workbook editions, or you're interested in Spanish language versions, those are all things that we've been working on but aren't up yet. Um, so reach out to Blake uh, if you have an interest in that. Um, and then I would also say, uh, actually, let me, let me end there um, so we can pass it on to the, the next presenter. Um, but thank you. Thank you both so much. Before we move on with our next presenter, I just wanted to draw your attention over to the chat window. I've been trying to answer some questions that have been popping up. Um, first of all, all of these resources are available on our Washington OER Hub. You could just type in the name of the resource that you've been hearing about into the main search bar. You can find it that way. Or specifically, if you want to look at our uh, OER grantee user group, you'll see all the resources that are listed in there as well. Uh, a note about registration, I saw somebody come up there. Uh, to download any material on the Washington OER Hub, you do not need to register. You are welcome to do that. Um, if at any point you are considering submitting resources yourself, or if you would like to do some work aligning resources to state standards, um, at that point, registration would be required. Uh, registration is also required if you want to save the resource and, and remix it, which just means, um, you know, making adaptations. Uh, you'll have a, you can make a new copy uh, to meet the needs of your student group. All right, with that, I'm going to turn us over to Lori at Federal Way Public Schools. Hi, I'm Lori. I'm the um, preschool through fifth grade ELA social studies facilitator in Federal Way. Um, so we created district-wide resources, and our purpose was to support teachers in building their classroom communities. So focusing on the diversity of student identities in the classroom, so that their ongoing instruction is based on that knowledge of students and students' knowledge of, them, knowledge of themselves and of each other and developing classroom routines to support student engagement using common talk structures, structures, excuse me, and text protocols. Our process, we brought together a group of our super talented, diverse teachers in kindergarten through fifth grade. We used resources from Teaching for Justice and resources that teachers have been using in their classrooms to create these units. Um, the teachers were trained in August and in September of this year, it was implemented in all of our kindergarten through fifth grade classrooms and taught to over 8,000 of our scholars. Um, what we came up with, what we created for each of those grade levels was 10 lessons to be done in the month of September to really, like I said, create that foundation for instruction throughout the year. year. Of ELA and social studies integrated units. Um, each of the units have daily learning targets and success criteria, student pages, assessment guidance, uh, reading protocols and sentence stems, 
anchor charts and accountable talk resources and scholar glossaries. So just sort of a complete unit that teachers have everything they need in one place to provide that instruction. We collected some feedback and people are super excited about um, this resource. What it enabled to have happen was not to leave up to chance that teachers spend that essential time in the beginning of the school year to attend to scholar identity and community so that all of our, that happened in all of our classrooms. And then within that teachers could adapt that resource based on the needs of their scholars. So what we came up with this is just what each the cover of each one looks like each um, grade level had the specific social studies theme that allied to their aligned to the grade level standards for their grade. Um, it built from kindergarten up through fifth grade changing a little bit and in each unit incorporating the identity um, parts of the scholars uh, repeating in each year. Um, within the unit, um, it's like everything they need in that one downloadable document. There's scholar journal pages that go with each lesson. So teachers, um, we compiled that in our in our case, we printed them out for all of the teachers, but anybody who wanted to use this resource could just print out those journal pages so that students had everything they needed for that instruction as well. So um, how you find it, you just go to the hub and you can type in federal way, or you can type in identity diversity community, or you could go by social study standards or ELA standards and just download the document. And similar to Educurious, it's all sort of a one stop shop document with the table of contents and the overview and then the list of student journal pages. And then each daily lesson has learning targets and things to look for for assessment, sort of detailed lesson plans and an assessment rubric and checklist for teachers to attend to how they will um, score that or what sort of learning evidence of learning they'll look for in student work each day. And if you have questions for me, you can send me a message in um, the chat or oh I didn't put my email on there, but you can also send me a message in the chat and I can give you my email as well. Thanks, Lori. Much appreciated. All right, we are going to do a screen shift again and I am happy to turn this over to Bukola at KSPS PBS. Hi everyone. So it's really great to be here. I'm Bukola Brzezinski. I'm the Education Director at KSPS PBS. Um, so we provide free, high quality educational programs on air, online, and within our local community. Um, we serve children and families here in Spokane, um, across Eastern Washington, Western Montana, um, Northern Idaho, and also Alberta, Canada. Um, so I'm really excited to share our, our OER curriculum project with you, uh, Learning to Code and Coding to Learn with PBS Kids Scratch Junior. Nicola, before you get too much further, just a note that you're in presenter mode. I don't know if oh. you can go full screen. Okay, let's see. Any tips around that? Would, um, let's see. Okay. Hey, there you go. You, you found your own tip. I was struggling to give one to you, so okay. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Great. Okay, um, so we had three main project goals. Um, so first um, was to provide a series of free curriculum resources for kindergarten through third grade educators, particularly those in harder to reach rural communities uh, to help them introduce coding to students and to build key STEM skills via the free PBS Kids Scratch Junior app. Second, uh, we wanted to create student-centered student inquiry-based lessons that can be used in a variety of learning environments. So after-school clubs, summer camps, in-person and virtual um, classroom les lessons, library programs, and so forth. And then third, um, we are wanting to increase kindergarten through third grade student engagement with the Scratch Junior app 
um, helping students learn how the games, media, and animations they love are made, um, and the fact that uh, these are made by people just like them. Um, and we want to help kids see themselves as future coders, designers, and digital creators. Um, so let's uh, watch this short video about coding with Scratch Jr. Coding is the new literacy. When we think about reading and writing, we think about words on a written page, but coding is the language that computers speak in. The way we define coding is creating a series of instructions that tells a computer or another piece of technology what to do. Gosh, when we think about computer coding, we think about people sitting somewhere in a dark room in front of a great big monitor and they know this secret language that no one else knows except them. But what I've learned with PBS Kids Scratch Junior is that everyone can code. It's a language that we can all learn and that we can all speak. It's not a bunch of zeros and ones. It's not even really an unfamiliar language. There's a lot of easy ways that you can implement it in the classroom. Blocks do a different thing. Okay. Okay, great. So our uh, OER curriculum um, includes seven standards-based lesson plans covering uh, a one-hour time frame. Um, so our lessons are adapted from PBS's national curriculum, um, and those lessons cover a two-hour time frame. Um, so if you have more time or you're looking for additional coding um, activities, um, you can check out the national curriculum, which is also available for free. Um, so you can scan that um, QR code or you can visit pbskids.org slash learn. Um, so our OER curriculum also includes student handouts and PowerPoint slides. Uh, the lessons are targeted for students in grades one through grades three. So kindergarten students can engage in these lessons with targeted support. Um, the lessons can be used for flexible learning environments. Um, and then in each lesson, the students are creating interactive stories and games um, featuring their favorite PBS Kids characters from Wild Kratz, Nature Cat, Word Girl, and Peg Plus Cat. The lessons are sequential. Um, they increase in difficulty. And each lesson builds on skills that are learned in previous lessons. So how to find our curriculum, um, you can visit uh, this link. Uh, it's available in the OER hub. Um, you can also scan this QR code, which will take you directly to our lessons. Um, so I'll now go live to the site and just navigate through the curriculum resources. OK, can everyone see our resource page here? OK. Oh, no, you're still on the, uh, the PowerPoint slide. OK. All right, um, so here is our resource uh, uh, overview page. So you'll find a short description of our curriculum unit. Um, you'll also find the type of um, open license that our curriculum unit is attributed to. Um, and when you click view resource, um, you'll see uh, uh, an overview of this curriculum unit. When you click on the next icon, um, you'll see uh, the full curriculum unit laid out. Um, again, you'll see an overview of the curriculum unit. Uh, the subjects are curriculum covers, uh, the, grade, the target grade levels, uh, the learning goals for the lessons, um, and then the alignment to the Washington State Computer Science Standards and the Next Generation um, Science Standards. At the bottom of the resource page, you'll see eight uh, uh, attachments. Um, the Word document here is our full curriculum unit with the seven lessons. Um, so I'll just quickly open that up. Um, If that's a Word document, we'll call it, it just yes. downloaded it, so it should be at the bottom tray. Okay. Um, does that, uh, can everyone see the unit up here? 
if you're sharing your individual screen, we're not going to be able to see it or your, you know, your, your window with the, um, Okay, Browser. I think I just shared it. Um, so this is the Word document that has the full curriculum unit. You'll see the seven um, Scratch Junior lessons here. Um, you'll also see uh, uh, student handouts um, that can be used. Um, we also have um, useful links uh, just for additional tips and activities there. Okay, so I'll, oh, let's go here. Okay. Um, and then in that same resource page, um, you'll see uh, seven PowerPoint slides. Um, and those seven slides correspond to the seven Scratch Junior lessons. Um, in each of the PowerPoint slides, um, you'll find instructions and images that will help guide students in the various coding lessons. Um, uh, and each PowerPoint presentation, you'll also find a script that you can use for each lesson um, and you can adapt, adapt to your own needs. Um, each PowerPoint also includes a warm up activity uh, along with a, um, an exit question. And we'll go back to the presentation here. Okay, um, so implementation tips for um, uh, doing a Scratch Junior in, in your classroom. Um, we recommend downloading the Scratch Junior app and exploring it on your own. Um, the app can only be used on iPads, Android tablets, and Android phones. It can't be used on Chromebooks or on laptops. Um, you can take our free self-paced educator workshop um, uh, on your own or with colleagues to gain a deeper understanding of the app, the student activities and the projects. Um, so you can access that workshop through this QR code here. Um, you can help your students and yourself uh, get started with the app uh, with the Scratch Junior um, how-to cards. Um, these provide an overview of the key coding blocks and sequences that students will be using in the different lessons. Um, you can also just print out these cards for students to have on hand throughout the seven, le uh, the seven lessons. It's a really great um, resource um, reference uh, sheet. Um, each of the lessons uh, build on previous skills from previous lessons. Um, so just really check as you're going through the lessons that the students have really mastered the target skill for one particular lesson. Otherwise, it will be challenging to, to move on to, to the other lessons. Um, have students use the same tablet or iPad for the series of seven lessons um, so that they can easily find their saved work. Uh, their work is all saved within that app. Um, and then lastly, we would recommend um, using a document camera to model activities um, and for students to share their projects. So uh, thanks for this opportunity to share our project um, with you. Um, I'm happy to provide additional information or if you'd like one-on-one -on -one training on the Scratch Junior app, um, we'd be happy to speak with you further. Uh, so feel free to contact me by email or by phone. So thank you. Thanks so much, Bukola. I am gonna ask uh, Libby to just go ahead and take screen control and she's gonna be talking about the resources from OneLove. All right, thanks, Barbara. So my name is Libby. I am an engagement manager with the One Love Foundation. And we were really excited about the opportunity to put together some additional relationship, additional resources to teach uh, young people about relationships, particularly in this case, as it pertains to the media. So for those of you not familiar, uh, One Love is a foundation founded to educate young people about recognizing healthy and unhealthy relationships, as well as empowering them to recognize abuse uh, and to love better in all of their relationships. So we have a lot of curriculum that's already out there. Um, however, we hear feedback that sometimes it can be hard to access the videos because unfortunately they are not uh, open resources. So we set out to create more resources that can be more accessible to educators, um, particularly in Washington. 
So again, a lot of the focus is relationship education. All of these resources, um, many are targeted at the high school age, but they are gonna be accessible for late elementary all the way up through 12th grade. Um, I'll talk a little bit about those adaptations. Uh, and in particular, just recognizing that relationships move beyond romantic relationships. So a phrase we use a lot is 100% of us are in relationships, 100% of us can learn how to love better. And so this aligns to not only romantic relationships, but um, friendships, sibling relationships, family dynamics, teammates. Uh, there's a lot of adaptations and applications uh, beyond traditional relationship uh, education. Again, something that we heard a lot from educators and teachers is that these conversations can be really tough. It can be really hard to, uh, we don't always know our role as educators. When do we talk about relationships? Um, but we know how important it is. We've gotten a lot of feedback from our students, especially over the last two years that they want to have the conversations, but they need adults in their lives equipped to do so. Uh, so that's also part of where, where the need and ask for these materials came from. All of our lessons are gonna be structured pretty similarly. Um, there'll be an introduction, there's an overview of what we call the 10 signs of a healthy and unhealthy relationship. Uh, we have different opportunities to watch TV clips that are sourced through YouTube, um, as well as listen to some songs. Uh, again, we're looking at the media. We also wanna be as low tech, no tech friendly as possible. So the lyrics are all directly included that are needed. You don't necessarily need access to, to the, the audio for the song. Um, and then there's always a plan to build healthier relationships. So either it's a mini project um, or ending activity, and then we have tools for knowledge checks as well. So these are the 10 signs um, of a healthy and unhealthy relationship that are embedded in all of the materials. A big push for us is teaching young people um, how to recognize these. We also have all of this particular information available in Spanish. Um, we don't have all of the lesson materials translated yet, but we're hoping and we're working with the team to hopefully get that created and uploaded as well. Some other themes that come up, these, this is what we call it. So know the signs, spot the signs is learning to recognize healthy and unhealthy behaviors. Um, in this case, we'll have separate resources for both high school and middle school, uh, making sure that the media references are developmentally appropriate for the different age groups. Um, well, we also talk specifically about communicating boundaries and practicing consent. Um, that's in particular thinking about affirmative consent language and then helping a friend in an unhealthy relationship. This is inclusive of bystander intervention, uh, but also goes beyond that into um, what I call bystander prevention. So we're waiting, we're not waiting for um, the incident to happen that we need to intervene, but teaching young people to start those conversations early um, and hopefully prevent abusive and unhealthy behaviors from occurring. We also have um, lessons and resources around how to navigate the endings of relationships, whether that's um, extracting yourself from an unhealthy friendship, romantic relationship, and teaching young people to access the resources in their community, as well as showing models of, um, in all of this, we're showing examples of um, healthy uh, relationship role models um, and unhealthy examples, or what we call that's not love. Uh, two examples that you might see pop up. We'll, we have examples from Schitt's Creek. Uh, this is a show that a lot of young people have been watching and has really been a huge piece of pop culture. And so there's going to be clips from here talking about the different relationships, giving students the opportunity to, to analyze the relationships in the show, recognizing the behaviors, um, and giving feedback to the characters on how they navigate the different scenarios in their relationships. Another example, um, Taylor Swift's music library is a great um, never ending resource of examples of healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviors. So again, there's opportunities to, to unpack the relationship dynamics in her lyrics, uh, thinking about what, what did she do well? What should she not do well? What did her partners do well or not well? Um, and then how putting yourself in the shoes of, of the song and maybe what you would do instead. Some other resources and supporting materials that we have avail will be available both on the OER and through One Loves Education Center. Uh, we have exit ticket surveys um, and then we can do the evaluation analysis if folks need that. Uh, we have alignment tools for comprehensive um, sexual health education, LEAD FCS standards, as well as both Washington's SEL standards and CASEL's standards um, for those who are juggling all of the above. Um, 
while these particular lessons are not yet um, evidence-based, they are based on the research um, that generated our other curriculum that is evidence-based. So want to put that out there with a little disclaimer, but it is, we do have that backing. We do also have parent education materials uh, if folks are interested in talking to the parents of your students about uh, what they're learning in class. We also have, um, in, in thinking about implementation, implementation tips, One Love does have a large library of film-based content that's housed. Um, it's all free, but it is housed in a gated um, online platform. So these lessons that were created for the OER are meant to either stand on their own um, as individuals, they can be strung together as a mini unit, or they can be used to accompany other One Love curriculum if you're already using that in your classroom. So again, our goal here is to really just make everything as accessible, as inclusive as possible, um, and to support you as educators in bringing these life-saving conversations to your students. And here's my contact information. Um, you can reach out to me. Uh, you can also just go through our website. Um, and I have many, many colleagues who can help you navigate these resources as well as um, our larger library of content. And that's it. Thank you very much, Libby. All right, moving along, I am going to turn us over to our colleagues at Renton Technical College. Allie, please take us away. Hey, I'm Allie Cohen. I work at Renton Technical College. A couple disclaimers that um, we actually weren't in the first group that was awarded, but thank you to Barbara, um, found us an opportunity to still be involved in January. So we are um, still uploading a lot of stuff, but have done the meat of it. And my other disclaimer, um, I feel like so underdressed my PowerPoint is so underdressed. I made the assumption that we all were going to have the same formatting, but I'm glad we didn't because I, you know, being late to the game, I get to benefit also from seeing what everybody else has put together and it's really impressive. So um, I work in our youth high school completion and we were really interested in this project because OER has been um, a, a big topic of conversation because the cost of textbooks at a college for dual credit students is a huge barrier. So um, mostly focusing on our dual credit college programs like Running Start, Open Doors, which is uh, youth re-engagement. You can waive tuition, you can waive fees, but how do you pay for a book on Amazon or at the bookstore? So that really becomes a barrier to student success. And then um, what we did was we focused on popular gen ed classes that were frequented by students taking dual credit. Um, that may also be part of an associate degree that could transfer anywhere. So uh, that was the scope of the classes that we were looking at. Next slide. So um, Day Zhang and Huma couldn't be here today, but Day is was the OER content expert and is really leading this campaign at RTC um, to have everything be OER. So he leads our steering committee, really working hard to increase OER at RTC through grants and projects like this. So we were really grateful for this opportunity because in some ways, um, OSPI is ahead of the college system and thinking through accessibility for textbooks. Um, and building a cult he's building a culture of the OER with workshops, resource guides. And so this was embedded in the campaign for, for faculty also to be a part of. And then he wanted to plug, you heard it here first, RTC, we want to be the leading OER college in Washington. Next slide. So um, Huma Mahabula is our anthropology humanities instructor, and she incorporated OER pretty early in her um, tenure at RTC. Um, and she's also our diversity, equity, in inclusion lead. So of course, OER was on her radar. So um, she converted her anthropology classes and that's what we have on the hub. And for her, the, the points that she wanted to make is that um, it was all about accessibility inclusion. The textbooks are expensive, um, hard, hard to build a class around. And by building her own material, she was able to um, be more selective about what she 
shows and the relevancy. And I think particularly for the humanities and anthropology, it lends itself well to find things that are more relevant and contemporary because there's so many contemporary examples, which she used in her example, um, in her resources for OER, whereas, uh, you know, even just the process of adopting a book for a class, getting it approved, and then there's a current event that's relevant, but if you don't incorporate that into your class, you're going to be on the same timeline of waiting for that to be in a book that's then published and then incorporated into the class. So just using OER, she was making the point that it, there's a lot more agility in the instruction if you go with OER because you're not tied down to this textbook um, that's at the bookstore. And, um, and then also she was saying that it allowed her the opportunity of getting feedback from students of like, what are, what are they listening to? What podcasts, what videos, what books are you reading? And then trying to um, find a way to weave them in as OER also, instead of again, that kind of usual college paradigm of these are the books that you go on the first week of class to go purchase. Next slide. So here's a example. We have her classes pretty up. Um, so anthropology, two, three, four, religion and culture. This would be a class that any student in Washington could take that would count towards an associate degree, would also count towards electives and maybe social sciences at the comprehensive high schools. So um, the title of the resources are what we refer to in the college system as modules, which is like our, our units. And then what I'm going to do, because I walk in both worlds, is then I'm going to be ad adapting this to the K-12 language of scope and sequence and the standards and the outcomes and all of that so that on both ends, these materials can be um, pioneering for the college system to be like, here, we're doing this here, but then also districts can utilize this for their dual credit programs or even their um, programs that are already just at the high school, like career technical education programs. So then Al Roth, and I think he may, he may need to be unmuted, is here. Yes. Yes, awesome, cool. Yes, and Al's gonna talk uh, more, more about his, he's on the math side. So I adopted an OER course from the, op uh, from the My Open Math, um, Emporium, as, it, as I'm calling it. And I can quickly share my screen and show you a few things, if I may. Uh, can I share my screen? You, oh, you know what, Al, hang on just a second. I don't know that you have screen control. So uh, give me a moment. And I can touch, I can quickly mention a few things. And you should be able to do that now. Okay. So I was, and just a quick time check for folks. I know we uh, we still have one more presenter too, and I hate to truncate things at the end, but just just to give you a heads up, Al. And I just lost the tab uh, oh, out no. of a bunch of things. Um, oh, it's over here. I think I can find it again quickly. Oh, it's here, and here we go. Sorry about that. Um, and it is not going to cooperate. Okay, we're going to have to skip that. So here's what I was going to say. From the slide, the important thing is to know this. Wherever you adopt whatever, thank you, whatever you adopt from the open educational resource offerings, from whether it's in math, anthropology, in, or civics, or history, or art, or anything, uh, what um, what is italicized and bold-faced here the, in the uh, slide is really important to understand. It's not just free to the students, but it's also accessible. And the idea is that you can, you can take it and just present it, but it's going to come with a host of problems. And you have to sit there and quickly or fast as you can figure out where those problems are, address them before you hopefully hit the ground running with them. And then in the course of using it, you'll find that there's a whole lot of things that need to be adjusted, changed, you know, deleted, added, and so forth. It, it's rarely the case that you're gonna find something um, 
that you can simply adopt and you know plug and play. You're going to have to do a lot of work on this. And so what I'm aiming to do right now with uh, the OER that I've adopted is to edit it, to edit the text that's being used. The text is the OpenStax test, text uh, from, um, I, I think it's the University of Washington, not University of Wisconsin. And I'm going to adopt that text, adapt that text. And I'm going to revise it so that it reads better, so that the students have something that is not just kind of chunked together and um, not, not smoothly presented. In addition, um, the biggest problem with statistics in particular, which is the course I'm presenting here, is that statistics is one of the hardest courses undergraduates will take, usually, oftentimes, with the exception of some things or other. With that said, if the underlying concepts aren't kind of clearly laid out, and it, you, you, the student will have a hard time applying it. Statistics is one of those things that currently in our society is perhaps one of the most important things that we can get at least a basic understanding of. So one of the one of my main focuses is to develop this course to to rewrite it, to edit the text and the, and the homework questions and the quizzes uh, and the exams. I, I've actually, I've already created the exams from largely from the quizzes, but to really make this a course that um, a student can conceptually wrap themselves around. Um, I'd rather they take a little and do something good with that than try to sort of, uh, you know, force a lot and get less out of it. Um, one of the things that is really important for just what I mentioned is that the student has to learn to ask meaningful questions. This is a goal. This is a principal goal of what I'm trying to do now. And uh, hopefully I'm going to get this done before June 30th. That's my hope. Thank you very much for your time. I, I've really enjoyed listening to everyone else speak. And thank you, Allie, for organizing this. Thanks, Al. Sorry. And I, I know oh, I was a little over. Yeah, that was like still under construction. <laughs> I should have seen that one. Oh, OK. And last but certainly not least, Carrie, I'm going to turn it over to you. OK, so this was. Um, Shape Washington, which is our state's uh, health and PE teachers association. So go ahead and go to the next slide. So this just gives you an overview of the four units that we ended up with. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So overall, our project goals going into it, which I think that we fulfilled very well, is that we want to focus on outdoor education but through the lens of movement and play. Um, so what we did is we kind of decided on categories and it's cool that we got kind of a potpourri of those. So you have your traditional outdoor sports like Frisbee golf, but then we had an outdoor, outdoor games category and then outdoor adventure. So I'll dive into those as we go on. The goal of this is that teachers could take the whole unit or just pieces of it, even just one game, a full lesson or whatever, to easily implement into a class, typically through physical education. But as you'll see, you could do it in science, you could even use it in math, um, really any class. And we align them all with the Washington State K-12 PE standards and outcomes. Okay. So here's an example. This is the Native American Games Unit submitted by Kristen Wynn at Port Angeles School District. This one is very unique because um, it really combines the history from the local native tribes um, around Port Angeles, which is also my hometown. So this is pretty cool for Krista to do this. And the unit was then reviewed by the district's local tribe representatives to ensure appropriate cultural representation, which I think is very important to do. And then we've given credit to them on it. Um, so what it is, is just a list of a bunch of games. So this one's a little different than what we consider a typical unit because it doesn't have to go through progression. And it's not really by lessons, it's just here's a game, here's a game. And it um, divides them up into individual or pair activities or team activities. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
Um, then we had a hiking unit. And this is neat too, because it's definitely getting out into nature, but it's teaching them things like leave no trace um, that could teach us so much about nature, but also just they could do things like tracking their number of steps and all that. So this one was done in the Mount Vernon School District by Nikki. Okay, next slide. The orientation, orienteering uh, unit is similar to the hiking unit where it goes through the whole gamut of everything from here's how we get out into nature, but then also how do you actually do it and all the preparation that the students would need before going out on some kind of a field trip. Um, so it can really encompass a bunch of different subjects as you go through it. Okay, next slide. And then this is one of our more kind of what we would consider traditional physical education where we take an outdoor sport, but um, instead of just teaching the sport, we're really teaching them too about how do you go about this in nature. So it's taught um, at the school, but then the idea is that kids will go out and do this at either Frisbee golf courses or just make up their own course. I mean, kids these days, especially just need to get outside more and just create any game that they can. And so if we're teaching them the basics of this, then they can carry it through. So this one was done in the Bellingham School District and it's a little bit more of your typical unit. It progresses lesson through lesson, but again, you could just take pieces of it to, to use that way. And that's it. Oh, that was it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I jumped to the last slide there, Carrie. Carrie, thank you so much. These are fantastic. And I appreciate everyone uh, spending some time with us today. Uh, so huge note to myself uh, that when you add more grantees, you also have to uh, make your showcase presentation a little bit longer. So I will, uh, I will definitely uh, take care to do that next time. In the meantime, I hope you all visit the Washington OER Hub. Uh, take a look specifically at the Washington OER information group. If you want to join that group, that's a way for you to keep appraised of any grant opportunities or other professional learning opportunities that come your way. Um, I will be happy to share the recorded version of this presentation on our OER website on the OSPI site. And as you've registered for this course, I'll send all that information out in an email here in the next day or so. So you will have links to all the resources. Thank you again to all of our wonderful presenters. Our grantees have done such hard work and I really appreciate their, their time and expertise and, uh, and being able to provide these open resources to share with all of you. So thank you all folks. Have a wonderful afternoon and uh, Hope to see you again. Bye-bye.